we're back at the social house Nairobi and luckily for us right here on the funny raw real football show we brought in some really important people from the KPL to tell us what next for the organization where have you been and by you I mean the entire KPL team uh, KPL uh, basically was almost remaining as a shell because once the uh, FKF took over running of the league, um, all the clubs uh, took a back seat and uh, decided to uh, play uh, in the FKF uh, managed league. Uh, but uh, however, uh, as, a, as a league, uh, the clubs are the owners of the company. So we've just, we've just been uh, trying to look at uh, the way forward in terms of the Kenyan Premier League. And uh, remember um, when the FKF was disbanded, Immediately, within two weeks, the clubs uh, came together to chart the way forward. And they put in all the claims that they had uh, in, in terms of uh, money that was coming from uh, FKF, in terms of grants, uh, money uh, they discussed on uh, referees' payments, and whether the league is going to continue fairly or not. So they had to engage the government to see whether the government can really support them in terms of... Uh, um, issuing monthly grants, and uh, you, you read it through the media that uh, it wasn't coming uh, as they expected. So um, during that time, um, late uh, 2021 in November, we wanted to re-strategize, and then we appointed a, a commercial director uh, because our future was now very bleak. So we needed to sit, go back, and see what we need to really focus on, and what can really inject more uh, capital within within the clubs. So we've been working on something uh, together with uh, the commercial director. Uh, we've tr uh, engaged the clubs to try and bring them back together under one fold. Those who uh, really formed the league have now uh, showed them the direction on the benefits of running a, a league professionally as opposed to uh, under the umbrella of the federation. KPO has been criticized in terms of lack of vision, uh, lack of focus, over-reliance on sponsors and not independence. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I disagree on that because um, we really tried to work hard closely together with the clubs. Probably uh, the shortcoming was what we uh, brought in and tried to build the capacity with the clubs, they never followed through. And you cannot do it alone. You, you also need all these people uh, uh, jump into ship and uh, uh, forge your way forward. Um, as KPL was starting, there were a lot of things that very many flaws that we had. And over time, we really made decisions that showed that there's some professionalism that is coming into the game. We managed to have partnerships that would forge ahead. We tried to work with the Federation, the, the ups and downs during that period. And uh, consultation is key in every department of, uh, of the game. Experience, they say, is the best teacher, right? You've experienced <laughs> KPL in power and now where you are. What life lessons can you pick from the past leading to the future? I think for one, uh, there's a point whereby clubs decided, uh, became divided. They were not speaking in one voice. Uh, not like the early years when we first realized our sponsorships uh, with the Super Sport, uh, uh, Kenya Breweries, uh, there was Momias at that point. Um, we, we, were, we were all making decisions in one unison. But uh, with the regimes that have come in, We've usually received a lot of uh, fights from the mother association. And uh, the downside is that the mother association is usually part of the company, but they usually behave that they are not part of the company. So that, that's a downside. So we should ensure that we are closely knit uh, football stakeholders that need to work closely together. And uh, I think that was a downside. Interesting you should bring that up because Celeste was a journalist who broke the whole story that brought FKF to their knees concerning that Afghan uh, drama has been quoted as saying there's a big disparity between the regime of Nick Mwendwa and the regime of Sam Nyamwea. And from you, I'm gathering that it's more of an open door policy. Is that the difference? It also took a while um, uh, during that period because uh, Nyamwea also fought KPL at the, at the onset. But... Uh, as I mentioned, communication is key. Uh, we came up with this argument saying that instead of blowing things out of proportion and we want people to invest in the, in, into the game, let's be sitting down and chatting the way forward. And that really helped. As of September 2020, when uh, now the league was being uh, taken over by uh, FKF, we needed a, a shift on uh, looking at what is really ailing Kenyan football. Because 
uh, right now we are looking at let's address the youth issue because nobody has ever talked about the youth issue. So we want to put more focus on youth football, uh, putting in investment into the clubs for the cl so that the clubs can be sustainability, uh, ensuring their structure would be able to invite investors to come into the club. So that's the direction we, we think uh, is going to help and uh, rebuild uh, Kenyan football. So that's our main focus now. So we can't say KPL is coming back because they went nowhere, as you've pointed out. So what is it? Is it a reawakening? For the earlier years, um, we, uh, we needed to first ensure that uh, the clubs work together. After working together, we needed now to pull them out of the leadership of the league and bring in professionals to take over from there. Uh, I'll give you an example because almost all the decisions were made by the governing council and they used to meet so often. They should bring in technocrats to now run, uh, as directors, to now run the league and bring a, a marketing professional, uh, bring a doctor uh, who runs the whole uh, uh, medical side of the, of the sport. So that, those are kind of things that uh, um, I think we, we, we took too long before realizing that uh, we needed now professionals to now take over and run, run with the league. Ah, like that, charting the way forward. Q Taiwo. I'm Taiwo Tino, commercial director of the Kenya Premier League and former Harambe Stars international striker. We're playing football like everyone else in the world. Top tier football. We can't attract money. We can't get the investors to come in. Why? I have expressed this before. Um, we need to get our football clubs incorporated, our professional football clubs incorporated as companies um, in which they can then raise capital for the expenditure of stadiums, facilities and youth development. Um, as things stand, most of our clubs are operating almost like charities, um, which makes it difficult for people to invest in. I think this is primarily one of the biggest challenges that we have at the moment. Um, if you look at the English Premier League during COVID-19, um, it was able to continue paying its expenses, paying for operations because of the structure of the club. And La Liga, now most of the clubs are looking at the English model and saying we need to adapt because during COVID they weren't able to raise capital. So we, I think here in Kenya, we have to look at our, um, our models and structures uh, for football clubs because so far they've been failing us. We have clubs like Gormai ASC, community-based, and then there are clubs that are corporates sponsoring these clubs. What are your thoughts on this? Again, it comes down to structure. You know, look, if you think about it like this, yeah, if, if I'm a football club and I do not have shares to offer an investor, what incentive does an investor have to provide capital? That's, that's what you're basically dealing with. Um, but most of our clubs are offering similarly like charities. They're asking for donations, they're asking for sponsorship, but nothing in return. And professional football is a business. Um, if you, I, my old club in England um, has a hotel, has conference and banqueting, has hospitality, has medical facilities, has trading businesses attached to the stadium. So all of these businesses are generating cash flow, positive revenue, um, despite the stadium not always being full, or despite the club not doing well in its league position or maybe not selling as many players as they hope. So let's talk strategies then. What strategies are you coming up with that will actually help this game? I've put together um, a simple strategic plan with four objectives that start with grassroots football. Um, and if you really want a successful football industry, you've got to have young people playing football from a very young age. In England, we have three million kids playing football every year. Here in Kenya, we have to understand football is a numbers game. If you get more kids playing, you have more chances of some of them becoming professionals. But also it's a health, um, I think it's a health benefit. And this is where I think um, our education sector, both public and private, needs to look at um, the health benefits attached to having young people participating more in football. So we need to be addressing um, this. Uh, and part of my street plan is to implement grassroots football into some of the primary and secondary schools with the brand of Kenya Premier League. 
I think it's both from a resource and an aspiration standpoint, young people are going to be more incentivized and more, I guess, happier to be playing in a, a primary, secondary, Premier League um, league rather than just playing, you know, amateur or non-serious um, football competition. So that's the first objective. The second objective is to get a business, a football business academy here, because I think some of the, the issues we're facing is partly down to skills-based education around football as a business. That way we'll have an, a group of people who can come into the football industry, run it, invest in it, or administer it according to football commercial standards. Um, and that will create success here. And you know, I only have to um, refer to the fact that Kenyans are spending $1.4 billion on gambling, young, mostly young Kenyans. And so, you know, if we create, if we create the teams of people and the, um, and the environment for them to invest into football, then they will have stakes and shares in the future of the, of the economy. And that obviously will pay dividends. That's objective number two. Objective number three is to get the clubs incorporated so that they can actually receive this investment. So that means you can buy a stock in a club. The club can use that money to do whatever it needs to do. And then if you want to sell your share, you can sell it on the market. And I think this will also create more value again for investors into football clubs. Um, and like during the pandemic, English clubs were able to raise more capital um, from the stock markets um, due to the fact that they weren't able to fill the stadiums with um, uh, fans because of COVID restrictions. And if you look at Spain, a lot of the clubs in Spain are similarly operating like partnerships. Barcelona, for example, wasn't able to raise capital because they weren't listed. And now they're looking at the same model of, as English clubs yeah. because of obviously the COVID pandemic, reducing their ability to obviously um, raise more capital and buy players. So I think here in Kenya, we should be looking at that and saying, okay, let's look at the English league because it's, the, it is the, it's not just the most successful league based on football, yeah. it's the most successful league based on sustainability and business model and acronym. Um, and then my fourth objective is that we need to implement um, a multi-sports division. So like in Spain, which they do successfully, they have football and basketball teams under the same brand. So Barcelona, Real Madrid are both basketball teams. And I think what, what that helps um, with in Kenya is that you've got a large population of football fans and everybody wants to be in football. So if you can get a football club operating as a basketball team as well, obviously with different technical management, um, it gives fans the ability to support that basketball team as well. So like Gorma here could be a football club and a basketball team. And then more young people are playing for Gorma here. And hopefully the basketball team will be commercially viable as well with investment so that more players can become professional. And then there's a route up into European clubs that are operating in the same manner. So I'm not a big fan of young players going to America to play in colleges because they don't get paid. Yes. You know, yeah, you get your degree, but if you can't get a job afterwards, then what, what's that degree worth? So I think skills-based education and multi-sports division can work hand in hand to provide more opportunities to young people to get the experiences in football and sports and then go on and make some money from it as well. It's interesting you should talk about that uh, because Ulinzi Stars, for example, have a basketball team and a football team. But then there are clubs like Tusker, who are corporates, and rumor has it, you know, it's not exactly the best kind of relationship. Why? From a legal standpoint, the clubs have to recognize that when they're using their corporate, Tusker, when they're using their corporate name, trading as a football club, they're bringing um, exposure to liability. So if a player gets injured, or if anything goes wrong in the football club, it's Tusker, the beer company that can potentially be um, exposed to legal liabilities. And what I've, I've said to the KCBs, the Tuskers and Equities is that to de-risk your operations, you should be using geographical names for your clubs, separate from your business. If you want to sponsor the club, that's separate. But to use the club as the name of, let's say, Tusker, I think is, is, is not uh, an advisable thing to do. Um, and I think they should be um, operating as a geographical location. Thank you.